Hi everyone! Welcome to Activity 7. Today we are going to talk about the different laboratory equipment. Although we have come across um, some of them in our previous lessons like the biosafety cabinet, we also have the fume hood. But today we'll look deeper into the other laboratory equipment used by medical technologists. The type of equipment required in a medical laboratory is determined by the size of the lab and also the number and variety of tests performed. A small laboratory may have a microscope, refrigerator, and centrifuge. But if a laboratory is quite big, it will have an assortment of equipment including instruments such as pH meters, autoclaves, balances, incubators, water bath, and even blood analyzers. For reliable test results, equipment used in the testing process must be operating correctly. Therefore, personnel must not only know how to perform a test but also the proper care and maintenance for a specific machine. The use of your laboratory instruments and equipment can present hazards such as risk of exposure to moving mechanical parts, high voltage electrical current, toxic chemicals, cuts from broken glass or sharp parts, or burns from steam or hot liquids. All these instruments must be operated in a safe manner, and it is only imperative to consult manuals provided by the equipment manufacturer to determine the proper use of each piece of equipment. So let's take a look at some of the different equipment um, we use inside the laboratory. We start first with our laboratory balances. So this equipment, it's used to weigh chemicals and media, media used for culturing bacteria or microorganisms. So we have two types of our laboratory balances. We have the double pan, which is used for direct comparison. So this one is a single beam with arms of equal length and standard weights are manually added to the right side of the equipment to counterbalance the object weight. We also have another type, the single pan. This is used for substitution. Um, the arms are unequal in length and the object is placed on the short arm pan and a restoring force is mechanically applied to the other arm until the indicator is balanced. So this is how a double pan looks like. So, basing on the previous definition of a double pan, the arms have equal length. And our single pan, um, the arms are unequal in length. Where basically, your single pan contains only one pan. We also have another kind of balance. We have the triple beam balance. So, this is a measuring instrument comprising of a beam which is supported by a fulcrum. This is a manual type of laboratory balance and it can weigh up to as small as 10 micrograms or 0 0.001 grams. So this is how your triple beam balance looks like. A triple beam balance enables the user to measure the mass of an object by balancing it with the help of three counterweights of known values. So these are the counterweights that we are referring to in the definition and this is the part of your triple beam balance where you put the object that you want to weigh. Now we go to the different parts of the triple beam balance. So the first one here is the base. The base is the solid metal platform that supports the rest of the parts of the triple beam balance. It also provides stability to the apparatus while the measurements are being taken. Next, we have the pan. The pan is where the object to be weighed is placed. It's located on one side of the apparatus and rests on top of the base. The third part is the adjustment knob. It can be turned to attain greater accuracy while measuring the weight of an object using the triple beam balance. It's located on the left-hand side of the apparatus beneath the pan. We also have the pointer, which is present on the right-hand side of the triple beam balance, and by default, the pointer points to zero on a labeled scale. The other parts of our triple beam balance include the triple beams, which 
comprise the three beams that are individually used to determine the object's mass. And we also have the rider that the user manipulates along the length of the beam to determine the object's mass. So if we take a closer look at our triple beam balance, so let's look at the parts. We have the pan. Again, this is the platform where we place the object to be um, weighed. We also have the adjustment knob. We have the base that supports our entire structure. We have the beams. Okay, the beams will determine the weight of our object on the pan as we move the riders. Okay, and then we have the pointer. Okay, so looking at this illustration, the weight of the beaker with the liquid solution that is placed on the platform, if you try to look at this scale here, the weight of the object placed is 444 grams. Okay, so that's how you manipulate and read the results of your triple beam balance. We also have the digital or electronic balance and this kind of balance, they rely on the principle of electromagnetic force and they can weigh as little as 0.1 micrograms or 0.0001 gram. They are used for most critical weighing and examples of electronic balances are the cabinet balance and the single pan or the top loading balance. So for the cabinet balance, um, you can find this one in the chemistry department because I can remember when I was in the first year, um, we made use of this kind of digital balance to weigh a certain object for our chemistry experiment. And for the single pan or top loading balance, we have this one in Angelo King because um, it's very useful when we weigh powders or agars for making our um, culture media. So you have to place the object on the pan to determine its weight. For the safety and quality assurance of our laboratory balance, we have to remember the following things. First, keep balances clean all the time. Wipe up any spills immediately. Second, do not subject the balance to sudden shocks and do not move it from place to place. If you're going to acquire a laboratory balance, you also have to designate a specific area inside the laboratory where you are going to place the balance and if people will use the equipment they just have to um, go there and do the weighing so that is to avoid um, transferring of the balance from one place to another third position the balance on a draft and vibration free counter special tables and supports are available if vibrations are a problem so we are trying to avoid vibrations when we are using the electronic balance or any kind of balance because vibrations contribute to um, inaccuracy of getting the weight of a certain object. So we have to place our laboratory balance in an area that is stable or not movable. Fourth, respect the sensitivity of the balance. So do not try to weigh, for example, 0.001 grams on a balance accurately to only 0 0.10 grams or 0.10 grams because if you try to compare your 0 0.001 to 0 0.10 um, there is a big difference between the two weights so if the procedure asks for 0 0.001 you weigh the powder for example to 0 0.001 and not 0.10 grams okay fifth calibrate balances on a regular schedule perform yearly maintenance or contact a technician to have it done um, there are people who are assigned to perform calibrations of certain equipment and sometimes it's not the job of the medical technologist to perform the calibrations unless he or she is trained to do so so if um, you're going to have a machine calibrated. You have to call someone from the company where you purchase the machine to perform the calibration. 
Six, um, wear gloves when weighing chemicals to avoid skin exposure to chemicals. Well, of course, um, PPE is still very important even if you're just weighing um, chemicals or materials using the balance. Seven, avoid breathing chemical dust by wearing a mask when weighing irritant chemicals. So again, it all boils down to the use of your personal protective equipment. Another equipment that is commonly used or encountered um, in any section of the laboratory is the centrifuge. So this is your centrifuge right here. It is a piece of laboratory equipment that is driven by a motor which spins liquid samples at very high speeds. It is also used for separating the cellular components of the blood from the liquid portion. The laboratory centrifuge works by the sedimentation principle wherein the centripetal acceleration is used to separate substances of greater and lesser density. So what happens, um, for example, in blood samples when we subject them to centrifugation after spinning for 5 minutes, 5 to 10 minutes, we actually get a result of separation of the different components of your blood sample. So it is expected that the heavier components will settle at the bottom of the tube, then the lighter components will have to be on top of the heavier components. And that is how the liquid portion is separated from the solid portion of your blood sample. The clinical centrifuge, um, it's used for urinalysis and serum separation, and it has a speed of 0 to 3,000 revolutions per minute, and it has a capacity of 5 to 50 ml. The centrifuge is composed of a rotor, which is used to house the tubes where separation occurs. There are two main types of centrifuge rotors. The first one is the horizontal head, or this is also known as the swinging bucket type of centrifuge. The tubes are held in a vertical position when the centrifuge is not yet moving, but are horizontal in position when the centrifuge is fully in motion. It can produce a tight pellet of precipitate, which is usually found at the bottom of the tube, and this type of centrifuge is recommended for serum separator tubes. We have here pictures depicting the horizontal head centrifuge. So we have here the rotor on the first part or the container of our tubes. So basically, if the centrifuge is not yet spinning, the tubes are in vertical position, but once the centrifuge is fully in motion, the vertical position is changed to a horizontal position, like what is seen on the second picture. So at rest, the tube is in vertical position, but if the tubes are already spinning, it will be in a horizontal position. Another rotor is the fixed angle head. Okay. Um, in this type of centrifuge, the tubes are held at a fixed angle, which is usually at 45 degrees, and the sediments pack at an angle, or usually on the side of the tube, but not as tightly as with a horizontal head centrifuge. The angle centrifuge heads are less affected by heat buildup due to air friction. So this is an example of a fixed angle head centrifuge. So when you use the centrifuge, the positioning of the tubes are already slanted at a fixed angle, and that is 45 degrees. If we try to compare our fixed angle centrifuge to the horizontal centrifuge, we can see um, many differences, such as the positioning of the tubes. Again, for fixed angle, it's already positioned at an angle of 45 degrees while for the horizontal head centrifuge there is a change in the position from vertical to horizontal position once the centrifuge is fully in motion and they can also be differentiated by the kind of pellet that is produced after centrifugation the horizontal centrifuge offers 
a stable pellet that is formed at the bottom of the tube. And for the fixed angle centrifuge, the pellet is not as stable as the pellet produced in the horizontal centrifuge. And the pellet is formed at the side of the tube for fixed angle. Another kind of centrifuge we use inside the laboratory is the ultra centrifuge. This one is a centrifuge optimized for spinning a rotor at very high speeds. And the speed of the rotor can range from 60,000 revolutions per minute to 150,000 revolutions per minute. The function of the ultra centrifuge is that it separates smaller molecules that cannot be separated from using traditional centrifuges. The chambers must be kept refrigerated and it should be at a high vacuum. Most ultra centrifuges are refrigerated in order to control the heat that might be generated due to the excessive speed. This is how the ultra centrifuge looks like. It's quite a big centrifuge because it has to accommodate a lot of samples. I have seen one like this when we had our educational field trip in Manila when I was in the fourth year. We went to a laboratory in the National Kidney Institute and then they have this ultra centrifuge and they use that one to spin um, blood bags and our blood bags it contains um, quite a big volume of blood, usually 450 ml, and it has to be separated, especially if um, only a certain component of the blood bag will be used. So they have to spin the blood bag and generate these components by using the ultra centrifuge. Another type of centrifuge used inside the laboratory is the serofuge. This is a piece of laboratory equipment that is used primarily in the blood banking section by spinning the serum from whole blood red cells of certain patients. The dimensions of the tubes that can be used inside a serofuge differ depending on the test that is going to be performed. For test tubes having dimensions of 10 millimeters by 75 millimeters, they are used for agglutination grading. And for test tubes with dimensions of 12 millimeters by 75 millimeters, they are used for setting up serological titers and red cell washing. The glass test tubes are usually centrifuged for 20 to 30 seconds in order to achieve proper blood bank agglutination grading. The speed of the serofuge um, it is between 3,400 to 3,500 RPM when they are used for red cell washing and for grading. So this is your serofuge. Um, I particularly like this type of centrifuge, especially in the blood bank section, because all you have to do is load your test tubes containing the sample and the reagents and then you just have to set the time for example for 30 seconds and then after 30 seconds automatically the centrifuge will just open by itself so there is a timer for the actual spinning of the test tubes and then automatically the lid will just open when the time is already up and then in the grading of the agglutination, this is what we are trying to look at after we spin our tubes. So you have here your red cell button and you have the clear fluid there that is the supernatant. So in the blood banking section or in blood bank, when you reach third year, you are going to grade the agglutination of your red cells after spinning them inside a serofuge. Another kind of centrifuge we usually encounter inside the laboratory, specifically in the hematology section, is the microhematocrit centrifuge. This type of centrifuge spins capillary tubes at high speeds so that hematocrit values can be determined and measured. The speed of centrifugation ranges from 11,000 revolutions per minute to 15,000 revolutions per minute and the duration of spinning is five minutes. 
this is how your microhematocrit centrifuge looks like. So what you're going to do here is you have to place your capillary tubes on the gasket and the capillary tubes should be balanced. After which you have to place the cover of the gasket and then you close the whole microhematocrit centrifuge by pushing the lead and then you set the time for spinning the capillary tubes. And then after which you have to use a rectangular reader or a circular reader to determine the hematocrit level of your patient. So we have here a closer look on our gasket inside a microhematocrit centrifuge. So notice that we have two capillary tubes filled with the patient sample and they are placed opposite to each other because that is the proper way of balancing our capillary tubes inside a centrifuge. Also, to avoid breakage of our capillary tubes, we have to properly balance them or properly position them on the gasket. Notice also that our gasket has numbers. So you have here our first capillary tube, its position on um, number 10. And our second um, capillary tube, it's positioned on number 22. So as a medical technologist, if you're going to spin a lot of capillary tubes inside the centrifuge, you have to be responsible in labeling the number on which you positioned your capillary tube. You have to place that one on the request form because... Uh, this is to avoid mixing of our samples, especially if we are going to spin a lot of capillary tubes. So you have to properly label the request form of the patient with the number wherein you position his or her capillary tube. And then if everything is already properly positioned on the gasket, you have to place the cover and then close the centrifuge and it's ready for spinning. After spinning the capillary tubes inside the microhematocrit centrifuge, you have to remove them and determine the hematocrit level by reading the capillary tube using the circular or rectangular reader. So, um, hematocrit is actually part of the complete blood count. It's one of the parameters in your complete blood count and it will be thoroughly discuss when you reach a third year but in second sem in a major subject called his this topic and this activity will be um, performed by first year students so you will have an opportunity to learn how to read the hematocrit level of your patient so for now let's just um get the idea that these are the following apparatus that you're going to use um, in the determination of the hematocrit of a person. Here are some general rules that we need to remember when using the centrifuge. First, always operate centrifuges with leads closed. This is to protect the operator from accidents that may result from sudden breakage of your glass test tubes. And also to prevent inhalation of aerosols, we have to close our centrifuge properly. Next, balance the contents before turning on the centrifuge. Um, it is important that, again, we have to balance our tubes by placing them opposite to each other. And not only in the proper positioning that there should be balance, but we also have to look at the contents of our test tube so try to compare the amount of sample in the first tube to the amount of sample in the second tube and that would tell you that they are equal or balanced third allow the rotor to stop spinning before opening centrifuge lead because if you're going to forcefully stop your centrifuge from spinning you can contribute to the formation of aerosol fourth Spin samples with leads on to avoid creating aerosol. So you have to um, cover your test tubes properly also to prevent the formation of aerosols. And lastly, use only tubes specified as appropriate for a particular centrifuge. Um, if you try to look at the 
area of the centrifuge where you are going to place your tubes, you have to look at your test tubes if they can fit or not. Okay, so you also have to check the size of your tubes with the kind of centrifuge that you are using. For the maintenance of our centrifuge, we have to check the safety and quality of our centrifuge weekly, monthly, and quarterly. For weekly maintenance, we have to clean the interior components of the centrifuge with soap and water, followed by a disinfectant, which is 10% sodium hypochlorite that is freshly made. And we also have to include in cleaning the sample bucket. So why is this so? Because sometimes there are instances wherein um, some of our tubes or capillary tubes we are spinning inside a centrifuge, they are washed out or washed off or they break. So we have to clean the centrifuge and that is done weekly. For monthly maintenance, we have to check for unusual vibrations and the braking mechanism of our centrifuge to ensure a smooth gradual stop. And we also have to check the timer of the centrifuge using a stopwatch. For the quarterly maintenance, we have to check for the revolutions per minute at several commonly used speeds. Another equipment that we use inside the laboratory is the autoclave. It is a pressure chamber that is used to sterilize equipment and supplies by subjecting them to high pressure saturated steam. It is useful for sterilizing culture media and surgical materials and it relies on the principle of steam under pressure wherein you subject the material to a temperature of 121 degrees Celsius for a pressure of 15 pounds per square inch and for a duration of 15 minutes. The biological indicator for the autoclave is the Geobacillus thearothermophilus or previously known as the Bacillus thearothermophilus. Biological indicators function by introducing highly resistant bacterial spores into the sterilization cycle. It is understandable that most bacterial spores are difficult to kill at a very high temperature and thus um, scientists were able to determine the use of this biological indicator. It is commonly used as a challenge organism for sterilization validation studies and periodic check of sterilization cycles. The biological indicator contains spores of the organism on the filter paper inside a vial. After sterilizing, the cap is closed, an ampule of growth medium inside of the vial is crushed, and the whole vial is incubated. A color and or turbidity change indicates the results of the sterilization process. No change indicates that the sterilization conditions were achieved. Otherwise, the growth of the spores indicates that the sterilization process has not been met. So here are some examples of your autoclave. So we have the pressure cooker type of autoclave and we also have autoclaves that look like washing machines but they actually are autoclave. Our autoclave, like any other lab equipment, has also several parts. So these are the parts of the autoclave. First we have the autoclave chamber. It's the area of the autoclave or the part of the autoclave where we place the materials to be sterilized. Second, we have the metal jacket. It surrounds the chamber and it's also the source of the steam. Third, we have the door or cover, which is securely locked and has a seal to prevent escape of steam. Fourth are the gauges, which separate the temperature from pressure. So this is how the autoclave works during sterilization. We load the materials that need to be sterilized inside the autoclave and then we close the door. When we turn on the autoclave, there is a supply of steam that is constantly produced into the chamber where the materials were loaded. So we have to remember that if we are going to 
sterilized laboratory glasswares with caps or covers, we need to loosen them so that the steam can properly penetrate the laboratory glassware. So all these processes or all these things can only happen if we are going to maintain a temperature at 121 degrees Celsius with a pressure of 15 pounds per square inch and for a duration of 15 minutes. But most of the time, you can actually extend the duration of the sterilization process up to one hour. Here are the stages of autoclaving. The first stage is the warming up stage, wherein the chamber of the autoclave is constantly supplied with steam until the chamber temp thermometer reads 121 degrees Celsius. The second stage is the steam penetration into the load. So all of the materials that we place inside the autoclave, the center load temperature must reach 121 degrees Celsius. The third stage is the sterilization process or stage wherein the temperature is maintained at 121 degrees Celsius and the cooling down time, which is the last stage of autoclaving, is the stage wherein the temperature drops from 121 degrees Celsius to 80 degrees Celsius. So during this time, the sterilization process is almost done. Here are some safety precautions that we need to remember when using the autoclave. First, never open the autoclave door unless the chamber pressure is zero pounds per square inch. When we open the autoclave door, when the pressure is still at 15 and the temperature is still at 121 degrees Celsius, there is a possibility for the operator to suffer from burns. Second, items must be removed from the autoclave using tongs or heat-proof gloves to prevent burns after autoclaving. Third, liquids for sterilization must be loosely capped and placed in heat-resistant containers that are not more than half full. So when we load the materials inside the autoclave, they must not be tightly capped to allow steam to penetrate the materials completely. Fourth, the chamber pressure must be reduced slowly at the end of the liquid run to prevent liquids from boiling. The other laboratory equipment are categorized into temperature control chambers. So we have the above ambient or room temperature. We have the oven, the water bath or heating bath, and the incubator. For the below ambient temperature or equipment that has cold temperature, we have the refrigerator and the freezer. The oven is another equipment used inside the laboratory. It is for high forced volume thermal convection applications and it provides uniform temperature all throughout for materials that are placed inside the equipment. But most of the time, it's usually used for drying laboratory glasswares. The temperature for drying materials inside the oven ranges from 160 to 180 degrees Celsius for one and a half to two hours. The biological indicator used for ovens is the Bacillus subtilis variant Niger. When using the oven, you need to observe the three time periods. The first one is the heating up period, which is the time taken for the entire load to reach the sterilization temperature and may take about one hour or 60 minutes followed by the holding period wherein a temperature of 160 degrees Celsius is maintained for 45 minutes or 170 degrees Celsius for 18 minutes. And lastly, the cooling down period, which is carried out gradually to prevent the glassware from breaking or cracking as a result of too rapid fall in the temperature. And this one may take longer than the heating up period because for the cooling down, it will take two hours for the entire process. Another equipment we use inside the laboratory is the water bath. This is an equipment made from a container filled with heated water and it's used to incubate samples 
in the water at a constant temperature over a long period of time. The following are some of the functions of the water bath. It's used for microbiological laboratory work and it can also be used to enable a chemical reaction to occur once the water reaches a certain temperature. Some of the laboratory sections that make use of the water bath are hematology, blood bank, we have histopathology, and also microbiology. In hematology and blood bank sections, we usually set the temperature of the water bath to 37 degrees Celsius because um, in these sections, we would like to observe reactions that actually occur inside a body. Okay, so our body, it has a normal temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. If we want to observe a reaction in vitro, meaning outside the body, we have to set the temperature at 37 degrees Celsius. And the only apparatus or equipment that is capable of doing this is the water bath. So the water bath actually mimics the temperature of the body in vivo, which is 37 degrees Celsius. So if you want to observe or enable reactions outside the body, and how would these reactions go about in inside the human body, we make use of the water bath to mimic the temperature. So that's the purpose of the water bath. For blood banking section, the purpose of the water bath is to thaw um, some of the blood components like um, fresh frozen plasma uh, when we see fresh frozen plasma they are these are blood components that are placed inside the freezer so if we want to transfuse them to patients we don't transfuse the frozen plasma in a frozen state so we have to thaw that by using the water bath and that's the purpose of your water bath the water baths we use inside the lab are of different types. So we have two. The first one is the manual, example of which is the flowing water bath and the floating out bath. So this type of water bath is commonly used inside the histopathology section. And we also have the digital water bath, an example of which is the electric water bath. So for the electric water bath, we use this one in um, blood bank and hematology sections it's where we place our samples especially for tests that require the water bath for a reaction to occur here are the different parts of our water bath so first we have the digital interface or dial which allows the user to control or manipulate the temperature of the equipment so you might want to um, set the temperature to 37 degrees Celsius or any temperature depending on the test that is being performed. So you can manipulate the digital interface or dial. Another part is the indicator light. This turns on to indicate that the water bath is working. Usually if the water bath is already turned on, the indicator light would turn green. If it's heating, when you set the temperature, the indicator light would turn red, okay? And the third part of the water bath is the secondary safety setting. This one prevents the water from heating to a higher temperature. So our water baths are very um, particular with the temperature at which you set them to heat. So it also depends on the temperature that you want to achieve when you manipulate the digital interface or dial. The secondary safety setting is only um, the part of the water bath that prevents or protects the user from heating the liquid to a higher temperature. Next, we have the incubator. So this is your incubator and this is usually um, seen in the microbiology section. After culturing our microorganisms, we place our petri dishes and culture tubes inside the incubator. 
This is a device used to maintain specific temperature and humidity in the cultivation and manipulation of microorganisms for medical treatment and research. For incubating bacterial cultures and other microbiologic procedure that needs constant warming at 37 degrees Celsius. So we also set the temperature for our incubator at 37 degrees Celsius because usually this is the temperature at which most microorganisms proliferate or grow. We also have cold temperature equipment inside the laboratory and these are the freezers and the refrigerators. The refrigerator stores sterile media, reagents, and preserves stock cultures. And the temperature of the refrigerator must be maintained between 4 to 8 degrees Celsius. For the freezer, it stores dry reagents, antibiotic discs, and lyophilized cultures. And the temperature must be maintained between negative 10 degrees Celsius to negative 80 degrees Celsius. So the role of the medical technologist here is that the temperature should be checked daily for the freezer and the refrigerator because any changes in the temperature might affect the viability of any stored reagents or media inside the equipment. Here are some important reminders that we need to remember when using refrigerators and freezers inside the laboratory. First is these equipment are only used for laboratory purposes and they are not used for storing food. Second, they are monitored regularly to ensure proper operating temperature using calibrated thermometers and the temperatures must be checked before each use and recorded daily. Since I have mentioned in the previous slide that any slight changes in the temperature can affect the viability of any reagent or any culture stored inside the equipment. Another significant apparatus that medical technologists use inside the laboratory is the microscope. So this apparatus is significant because most of the laboratory procedures, um, you need to look at the results under the microscope. So this one is used to view microorganisms that are too small to be seen with the naked eye, but um, it's not only used for viewing micro microorganisms, it can be also used to evaluate stained blood smears and tissue sections. It also aids in manual cell counts for red blood cells, WBCs, and platelets. And it can also be used for examination of urine sediments as well as observing cellular reactions. You will be further um, introduced or acquainted to this apparatus when you go to second semester because there is a particular chapter or activity devoted to the use and manipulation of the microscopes and getting to know its different parts and the different kinds of microscopes. So we have different types of microscopes. First, we have the light microscope and under light microscope, we have a lot of different types. We have the bright field, the dark field. We also have phase contrast, the differential interference or the Nomarski microscope. We also have the fluorescent and the confocal. Aside from the light microscope, we also have the electron microscope. We have the scanning electron microscope and the transmission electron microscope. These two kinds of electron microscopes are superior um, in terms of the details you see if you're going to use this microscope. And the third type is the probe microscope and under which are the scanning tunneling microscope and the atomic force. So for second SEM, this school year, um, you will learn more about uh, these different types, but the microscopes that are available here in Angelo King are the bright field microscope, bright field compound microscope. We also have a five header microscope and we use that one for practical exams so that we can accommodate 
um, more students and so that we can finish the practical exam immediately. Okay, so the good thing about the five header microscope is that you have the teacher and the teacher uh, manipulates the microscope. Uh, he or she focuses the part of the slide or a certain cell or microorganism that she wants to be identified and then everyone um, who looks at the sample under the five header microscope actually sees the part of the slide that the teacher focuses so um, everyone has a uniform answer so we have these different kinds of microscope you have the compound bright field microscope and you also have the epifluorescent microscope. We also have the phase contrast and the electron microscope. Now, in terms of size, the electron microscopes are also much bigger compared to the light microscopes. We also have the cone focal microscope versus the atomic force. Now, um, for the scanning and transmit transmission electron microscope as well as the probing microscopes. The good thing about them also is that you can actually see the details of um, the sample that you are looking at under the microscope through a computer. And so you have an idea of what you are looking at. Unlike for the bright field microscopes, um, it's not that detailed compared to what is produced or the image produced from electron and probe microscopes. The spectrophotometer is another laboratory equipment used by medical technologists in the laboratory, specifically in the clinical chemistry section. This equipment is used for reading chemistry tests by measuring the light transmitted by a solution in order to determine the concentration of the light absorbing substance or analyte in the solution. Other equipment we use inside the lab are the pH meter, um, which is an important equipment to check for the pH level of some reagents or solutions. The importance of checking the pH level is to ensure that reactions would occur if the desired pH level is achieved. Then we have the vortex mixer. This type of equipment is used to concentrate the sample or solution by pushing the tube containing the sample on the black platform and um, a vibration would result from pushing the tube on the black platform so we need to be very careful when using the vortex mixer because the person manipulating this equipment must hold the tube firmly to avoid splashing of the sample we also have the Bunsen burner, which is a source of flame inside the laboratory, very useful in the microbiology section in sterilizing some of the inoculating tools like the needle and the loop. But today we are not already using this kind of um, sterilizer for our loops and needles because we are culturing inside a biosafety cabinet and remember that it's not good to use Bunsen burner or place a Bunsen burner inside a biosafety cabinet. It can destroy the HEPA filter. And we also have the hot plate. So precautions in using this equipment, um, we have to be careful when we touch this equipment because they may cause burns. I would admit that there are still other laboratory equipment or apparatus that I have not discussed or mentioned to you, but what I have shown earlier are some of the most common laboratory equipment used by medical technologists. So that's it for our discussion for today. Thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time.